This is a production of Cornell University. <laughs> hey, quiet in front. <laughs> Hello, welcome. This wild afternoon of wild poetry. I'm Joni Mikowski. I'm a member of the creative writing faculty here. It's my pleasure this afternoon uh, first to pause and ask you to turn off your devices. Uh, you know, your, your spaceships, your phones, your washing machines, and, um, and welcome, yeah. So the poet Julie Sheehan is the author of three highly acclaimed books, Thaw, Orient Point, and most recently, the mixed genre bar book, a combination uh, equal parts Molotov cocktail, dovetail joinery, and revelation. <laughs> Sheehan's awards include a Whiting Writers Award and a New York Foundation for the Arts Poetry Fellowship. And she's a professor and director of the MFA in Creative Writing and Literature at Stony Book, Southampton. And this spring, Julie Sheehan is our Barbara and David Zelastic Distinguished visiting writer here at Cornell, and it is the Zelaznicks who are making this possible. Um, thank you. Um, and, and so in this capacity, um, Julie Sheehan is bringing her, her otherworldly mixology to our spirits here, and it's, it's uh, wonderful. Okay, in, in, in Sheehan's work, mix reigns, okay, daring, weird, and transporting. Her poems juxtapose different tones, situations, rhetorics, allusions. One poem, The Ivory Build Woodpecker, in Orient Point, it's, it's concentric meditations on the Ivory Build Woodpecker, Jay Z, archaic English, and structural racism. And through this poem's daring and grace, it transforms the reader's understanding. Yes, it turns out these things have much in common. And they, and the Combination helps me to understand what I didn't. Her poems explore fearlessly what might seem antipathetic to poetry. A pervert exposing his genitals to children in Coney Island, being vomited on at a party, and still the party was great. Uh, okay. uh, abuse, and also about things as simple as a pine cone falling on the grass among blooming marigolds, the pine cone in tarnished armor, to whom the poet speaks. I see you've opened at last. I love you for it. Hail you, junk bloom, shingled stone. Winter's lurking somewhere, and shades will rise out of you, shuddering like iron bridges to a sun you never ruled. Her poems play defiantly and exquisitely. She's a master linguistic musician, and she builds her resonances from micro to macro, from individual poems to book length to beyond, weaving narrative idea, formal pattern, sound. Here from Brewer's Yeast, a lullaby in bar book, the poem reverberates doubled image about Brewer's Yeast, about what makes things rise, that yellow leavening, and also about early pregnancy, the corpus luteum, Latin for yellow body, Leavening's a woman bo leavening's leaven as it leavens a woman's body with hormones, so the embryo roots in the uterus. Quote, plexus and hoodwinker hoarding your leavening springs in abominable cavities. Yellow, your color is yellow, it's twirly bird, wherewithal swelter and swollen. Conception inside me as eggs dropped through shoots in a time kept obscurely. Your lunatic counterweight crippled and ceasing to heal me, to hold me, to render me thus, had I kept to myself, you perplex me, my heliotrope. Julie Sheehan's layered ruminations are not ordinary kaleidoscopes, they're curative ones, offering visions and revisions of a world dying from power control and isolation, from greed, from the fear or failure to question what makes another different from oneself. She's a consummate poet, artist, visionary, and teacher, and I'm honored to present Julie Sheehan. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, you haven't lived until you've been introduced by Joni. Thank you. Oh my gosh. And I do want to thank the uh, the uh, Zelazniks. I have not said that word out loud very much, but I promise to like repeat Zelaznik like a mantra because this has been such a gift for me already to be here in this fantastic community at Cornell and uh, to be here at this reading and here for the semester. And I really, I can't say enough um, thanks to the Creative Writing Program, Alice, uh, for inviting me, uh, the other Creative Writing faculty who are astonishing and wonderful, Lynn, who worked so hard on this reading, uh, and of course the, the Zelazniks for, you know, uh, for making it happen. Um, so thank you, and uh, I'm going to start with a new poem. So I, I was going to start with a poem that um, I've been reading Joni's stuff, and she writes in that triple rhythm that uh, you were you were use, that I was using in the poem you were quoting, and so I found myself doing that. Right, I'm under her spell, um, but I'm not nearly as good at it as she is. So that idea is out, and instead I'm going to start with a poem called uh, "Pack and Crack." <clears throat> Oops, I'm late for our next world war. Down with a headache the embedded kind that thrums like hip-hop radiating from a distant jeep heading toward the target coordinates of hot pants and camisole. I'm down with that. I'm down with personomycia, my world war one, so blush your cheek to render it a shade bloodier. Wipe that silly smile in rebel bloom while I lie down with curtains drawn. Down with the kind of headache that drones and thwacks a helicopter somewhere hard to gauge how far. But I'm down with sounds indeterminate of origin. Could my valiant brain prevaricate or do I feel that reverb down to the sub-basement where a Brazilian nightclub blasts emo samba, propaganda muffled in its tenor, regular in its bass. The bombs are heading one way, and it ain't up. Um, so I thought I would do a little survey of forms and then mix in some of the poems that uh, are more um, collage ragtag bundles of rhetorics oftentimes. Um, and uh, the first one I'll read is a villanelle, and I discovered, uh, I discovered this form during my, my suicidal poet stage, which came right after my horse stage, which put me at about 11 or 12. And its sacred text, as you can imagine, is the bell jar. And in the back, there were uh, there was some of uh, Sylvia Plath's juvenilia stuff she had written, you know, not really around the time that I was reading this book. And one of them was called uh, Solipsism, one of the poems back there. Uh, and it was a villanelle, and it went, "I close my eyes, and all the world drops dead. I open them, and all's reborn again." I think I made you up inside my head. Well, I was completely in love with this form and uh, for the next 15 or 20 years <laughs> decided I would write one of my own and try it and try it. And it's a really hard form. Uh, so it wasn't really until this book, the, this book came out, Thaw, my first book, that I had a Villanelle that I felt was worthy of an eye other than my own upon it. And it's called flame paper, which, does everyone know what that is? It's the stuff you can buy in like a magician supply or backstage <coughs> supply shops. That's, it's also called flash paper. And so it, 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 when you light it, it goes up in a harmless but very bright poof, flame paper. 
It goes up fast and punishingly bright, comes in blue, green, orange, but not for long. I didn't mean to fight with you last night. You know the stuff? Magicians favored slight. It hides left hands while right ones play along. It goes up fast and punishingly bright. Desperate for a gasp, a bad playwright might use it, or a gun, or girl in thong. I didn't mean to fight with you last night, to spur you, raging ever more uptight, but you were most spectacularly wrong. I go up fast and punishingly bright at cockily lax, knee-jerk, McCarthyite stabs like yours, pin prickles, paper prongs. I didn't mean to fight with you last night. P.S. You're holding poor man's dynamite. Read it and poof, our truce flames out. It's gone, gone, gone up fast and punishingly bright. I didn't mean to fight with you last night. And uh, before I wrote a successful in my, successful enough Villanelle, I, uh, I wrote many, many sonnets. So I'll read one from this book. Um, and I just really love the sonnet form. This one's called Cardinals on Kauai. Nursery rhyme for later in life. They were everywhere the year you weren't born. Big ones in dirty blurs. Their signals barely evident. Zipping like misfired flares. Or treed in green tangles. Aborted kites. <coughs> then the little gray ones, pert and trim, wearing their red like executioner's hoods. One outright bird hopping on the lawn, I taught to thieve corn chips from the lanai and watched him. That beak could crack a safe. It never rained. The temperature was steady. But something hinges on a cardinal I waited like the dirt there, which is red, red as the tang of chemotherapy. The plants take to it like their own blood. So uh, Marie Ponzo has some uh, amazing Sonnets, and uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the things I love about a sonnet is its meditation on an image that you can think through an image um, toward uh, the resolution of an idea. So the transformation of the image itself can be that kind of thought. And April Bernard has a really good way of describing that sort of argument that the image in a poem is making. And she says in the first quatrain, there's this and this but that, so this. And I just really love that stripping down to the logic of metaphor as a kind of skeleton for the sonnet. Um, and Marie Ponceau does that and narrative, which is a really crazy thing to do in 14 lines. She can tell a story and work an image through. Um, so those are two models I totally recommend for, um, for this form if you're interested in it. This, uh, this one's from Orient Point, my second book, uh, and it's called, just in case people didn't know, Sonnet. <laughs> to a marriage that cannot be saved by a weekend in Calistoga, and Calistoga is that spa place with hot springs and mud baths in Napa Valley. To a marriage that cannot be saved by a weekend in Calistoga. Like the worming in, the mud bath clasping too close, the forced wallow and float, revolting flex, dramatic shreds, 
Like ginseng molting in tea, oppression's hot, wet, fecal grasping. Or worse, oppression's aftermath, the prickle left when you brushed a spider from your lip. Insect scurry, low volt eight point grips you swear have colonized you, knuckle to ankle. Shudderful, the opposite of clean. A cast iron clawfoot tub, but light and charmless. A racist joke, too much, not enough. The weak twine of a contradiction, the stuff of truancy, and worst of all, harmless. That anguish of not saying what you mean. Oh, you know, I'll read the companion piece to Ivor Bill Woodpecker. Um, there's two poems in this that are, oh, look. Um, two poems in this uh, collection that, um, <clears throat> that use bird book entries um, as a kind of uh, framing text. And uh, one is the Ivory Bill Woodpecker, which is believed extinct. And the other is not at all extinct, and it's the brown-headed cowbird. Um, so this poem's called Brown-Headed Cowbirds, as identified by the Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Birds. And this is the first part of the entry. This species and the bronzed cowbird are the only North American songbirds that are brood parasites, laying their eggs in the nests of other birds and leaving them to the care of foster parents. <clears throat> out of the imagination, out of the brooding brain, out of the urban nest lined in desire, scavenged from American soil, woven in thorniest tree, out of instinct, springing stranger birds, strange birds, though common, foster birds, siren birds, their songs ruinous, out of neglect and knowledge of neglect and the outward show of caring, they come in, seeking survival. Part two of the entry. Unlike parasitic old world cuckoos, which lay eggs closely resembling those of the host species, cowbirds lay eggs in the nests of over 200 other species, most smaller than themselves. Befell that enrolling them in the anti-violence program, pursuing romance, Three tough girls of 12, invited forthwith to enroll. Three lumpish girls, most terrifying of hallway, fastest to grow and dangerously large, and he thrust into fifth grade with the smaller ones. Three, screeching with arrogance unearned, valor unloved. Full gladly enroll in they in the anti-violence program for it containeth a theater component as mandated by the most rightful and honorable board of ed for the sacred subparagraphs have made it so. And each girl dreameth of Whitney Houston and Jennifer Lopez that she may one day flouteth the midriff of Britney Spears. They liken themselves then as to the goddesses. They storm the pantheon as unto a sparrow's nest. They practice afore mirrors, bejewel themselves with hope, bejewel their dusky bellies, 
someday sanctuary of the handball boys who will nest their sweaty heads thereupon, who will see at last the full queenliness of the brown-headed cowbird, who will offer gold earrings and fall down in adoration. And the girls are eclept Shakina, Leticia, Kanesha. And the first name deriveth from Shah and Nika. Syllables, magnificent in sound, although without sense. And the second name issueth forth from the union of La and Tisha. Syllables also magnificent, which additionally lighten upon the Latin word for joy. And the third, Kanesha ariseth from the American Q plus Asia, both meanings unknown, although beauteous indeed. And the threesome writeth their names upon the sign-up sheet. They embellish their eyes with hearts, except Kanesha who draweth the flower inside her cue, for she hath no eye. They anticipate the starring role Juliet, the doomed one, Juliet, the goddess, they will all play Juliet to the handball boys, Romeos. And at the first meeting, they are cast as Capulets, who speak in most hotly, most warlike to Montagues. For the theater component hath an anti-violence motif. All of the love scenes have been cut. Some host species eject the unwanted egg. Others lay down a new nest lining over it, but most rear the young cowbird as one of their own. And the girls attempt to quit, but it is too late. They are adopted. The assistant principal hath recorded their names. The visiting theater artist hath received her stipend. The handball boys have committed infractions with all and languish in detention. Bethel that rehearse the girls. On occasion they rehearse. Between trips to the bodega they rehearse. To wit the biting of thumbs at one another. To wit the barbs verbal, taloned as fingers. To wit the unquenched fire of pernicious rage, purple like Martins. They run in through scenes familiar from the neighborhood. The fisticuffs and scramble, the outgrown bicycles barreling down upon trikes, the pigtails he trounced by plump cornrows, the double dutch push, the double dutch shove. And ever it you knoweth in her heart, I am the best actress. In the certainty of 12 years of life, she knoweth full well befell that Shekinah, Letitia, and Kanesha each proclaimeth, I am the best actress, and yieldeth not, and speaketh most hotly and warlike of the next one's faults, and taunteth each the others, and swinge them soundly, and the visiting theater artist rusheth to soothe, to placate, to becalm. She raineth positive feedback upon their rage, that it may be squelched. They remember not her name, this visitor from other worlds who flieth in and flieth out, her beak stuffed with morsels. They her clep and miss. Even so, her fondness for them prevaileth. And gabble in the girls their cheeky check and prattle they miss, miss. I am the best actress, right, miss? And Miss replieth not, for fear her students flee to the bodega and shirken the rehearsal. The young cowbird go grows quickly at the expense of the young of the host, taking most of the food or pushing them out of the nest. Time passeth, befell that the girls voyage to the citywide anti-violence summit conference. And they are unprepared, yet going forth they cocksure of greatness. 
and the Capulets and Montagues of PS 175 flock unto the Capulets and Montagues of PS 51 and PS 126. And each girl who knoweth her virtues in her heart proclaimeth to all, I am the best actress. Shakina, Letitia, and Kanesha proclaiming full loudly, I am the best actress, but Kaisha, Jolanda, and Deshauna, three others, are also each the best actress. The summit conference teemeth with best actresses, and Kaisha, Jolanda, and Deshauna speak hotly, get thee gone, they avouch, for thy acting is shite. Aroint thee witch, responded Shakina, Letitia, and Kanesha, for I am the best actress. And the Capulets and Montagues of various schools clear out and make in a rough circle, and the best actresses squabble in their midst, the best actresses and most valorous. And the Anti-Violence Summit Conference will invite PS 175 no more. It has been suggested that cowbirds become parasitic because they followed roving herds of bison and had no time to stop to nest. Look to thy purse, mend thy ways, O board of Ed. Though thou hast spent lavishly, yet hast thou failed to consider the roving herds of bison acts of survival, the persuasion of habitat. Look to thy bond and sin no more, visiting theater artist. Thou hast starved thine own young. Look to thy Selvin, Shakina, Letitia, thy brown heads tall among the blonde, the blood drying brown on thy feet where thou tramplest, stalking victorious in thy feathered cage. Look to thy virtue, Canatia, for the handball boys coming, fleet and hard and adoring, with gold in their talons and no time to nest. Um, I'll read a poem from Bar Book, uh, which as Joni uh, mentioned is kind of a, a book length project. Um, the main character is a bartender. She's also um, in the process of becoming a single mom. Uh, her marriage is breaking up in footnotes, which is <laughs> where they break up, where marriages fall apart in the footnotes, I'm convinced. Um, and uh, this particular moment is just uh, 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 taking a quick look at a couple of examples of children of divorce. And children of divorce do suffer uh, from higher rates of drug addiction. They uh, suffer from higher rates of bulimia and, uh, and anorexia. Uh, and. Uh, and they are sometimes developmentally de delayed. Um, and we were talking in my class, we're turning attention, uh, our attention to lexicons. So my students are going out in search of lexicons. And that's exactly what I did for this poem, um, <clears throat> which is called Grading Rubrics for Children of Divorce. And so I was looking at actual rubrics for essays by you know, first graders, <laughs> which it seems so cruel to grade them, but somebody somewhere is doing that. Um, so that lexi lexicon, um, just a quick thing about it. Uh, you'll meet Pew, um, which is not Church Pew, but the character from Treasure Island, the kind of creepy dude at the beginning of Treasure Island who's haunting the first uh, few chapters of that, um, Pew. Uh, and then the, it's in four little sections, the four sections of the rubric. Um, and uh, for the third, wait a second, maybe it's in five. One, two, three, four, five. It's in five sections. <laughs> the second one, I'm stealing from Paul Muldoon, who has these amazing poems he calls erratas, and they're 
they're themselves stealing from that uh, a, a printer's convention of, you know, when you have a typo, you, in the errata, you say, for this misprinted word, read this other word that's correctly spelled. All right, here we go. Grading rubrics for children of divorce. Mechanics, spelling, grammar, and punctuation errors. I like snacks, and snacks is spelled S-N-A-K-S. -S. I like snacks, he wrote, to filibuster a blank school day. His cobras coiled back home in a lunchbox. Six seemed much too young to master the silent E, an extra chromosome slithering like subtext at the ends of sense. And who could fathom GHT? There's violins, V I O L I N S, and then there's violence. Two phone numbers, no bus some days, say please, start at the top for L, N, B, and Q, but E starts in the middle twists on its spine, gets trampled by horses, beggarly as pew in chapter five. I hope he dies, my kind boy hissed at story hour. He didn't know he'd known so well that pew would perish, a plot point drawn like an E already in death throes before the horses come and as afterthought. We read, Pew died, he sobbed. Mom, I like TV where you don't care about the characters. I put down Treasure Island. He asked, where's dead? But meant another word without the E. Style, little or no sentence fluency, many repetitions, incorrect vocabulary, author does not communicate enthusiasm. For wrote, read rot. For dead, read dad. For naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y, read naughty. For Hades, read had. For the it, read tithe. For heat, read hate. For right, read writhe. For meat, read mate. Desire is reside. Denude is endure. To seek is to hide. Fraction is fracture. <clears throat> Organization. Introduction, body, and conclusion do not follow format. Miss Deference scores a line. The principal is Mr. Long, but he isn't long, he's short. No one's tuned to hear her hit the tact nicely on the head. So unlike her, said no one, as Greek gods bicker, social studies of exclamation points. Under her desk, in wads of molded gum, her pencil pokes the obverse of nipples or puts out Grecian eyes. Is anyone under the radar, under duress? She's testing blunt nose scissors. When they cut her arms, she'll starve and purge to get more edge, less form. She's cleared for future vanishing points where Aries and Harpina can howl Olympic obscenities in zero relation to her. 
content does not address the essay topic. What I'm trying to say is that when you divide something in half, you divide it in two equal parts, yes. And Dennis wants to share his snacks equally with Sarah. Draw a line on each food to divide it in half, they said. So I bisected the apple, the cheese cube, the pizza slice, the ice cream cone with my fat black crayon. But when they said, now color each half differently, I could not do it. What gods have joined, let no one put asunder. And I'll read one more. I love that giant clock. Every reading space should have a giant clock. It's really handy. I'll read one more um, poem. This one is a golden shovel, which is like a form that's taking the world by storm right now. Terrence Hayes made it up. And uh, does everyone does everyone know this form already? All right, I'm seeing some. Okay, so the poet Terrence Hayes made it up, and, and what it really is is a marriage between a poet of compression or a poem that's highly compressed and a poet who's expansive in his line. And he used the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, We Real Cool, We Love School, which is like, there's not more than three words per line in that thing. It's like super compressed. I mean, she could be expansive, but not in that poem. And he took each word of her poem and used it as the last line of his poem. And then he did other fancier things like run it backwards, do it double time. But just if you read the last word of each line in order, you'll get somebody else's poem. That's the idea of it. Um, and you have to work with a poem that's compressed or else your, your poem will be a bazillion lines long, right? So you need a pretty dense um, poem. And uh, of course, I, I have this uh, just really horrible relationship with Emily Dickinson. We're locked into this death stare with each other and so far she hasn't blinked and you know I don't know what to do with her and she like frightens me and astounds me uh, and she's incredible so naturally I picked her one of her poems for my golden shovel and uh, her, the poem is completely insane I'll tell uh, I'll give you the her poem it's number uh, 1071 and that's the title of this poem uh, perception of an object costs precise the object's loss. Are you with me? Because I bet you're already lost. Perception in itself again replying to the price. The object absolute is not and n nothing not. Perception sets it fair and then upbraids a perfectness that situates so far <laughs> and you know I, I've obviously internalized that poem I say it I try to figure it out I hammer away at it I get nowhere it doesn't have any images in it it's all abstract language. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> Use concrete language. <laughs> But I mean, you know, it's, and it's definitely something about how uh, looking at the, 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 you know, the relationship between the person looking at something and the thing being looked at is shaping events, right? Um, so my poem is gonna use each of her words and just to show how freaky she is. So these, you know, these are the words of her poems. And when I did it, I have a, a Five line stands, a four line stands, a five line stands, a four line stands, a five line stands, a four line stands. The word count in her lines is regular. There's something 
very wrong with Emily Dickinson, just saying. Okay, and this one sat on a bus headed into Nazareth. Nazareth, as we know, is, the, is Jesus' hometown where his Mary found out she was having him. It's not where he was born, but it was where he grew up. And it, for Christian pilgrim purposes, it's where, where the angel Gabriel announced to Mary the Annunciation that she was going to have a baby. And of course she said, I'm a virgin. And Gabriel said, don't, don't worry, you're gonna have it anyway. Uh, and, and by speaking, by announcing, so, you know, she's kind of impregnated by the word. And there's a church that the Catholic Church built a basilica on the site where this Annunciation is believed to have happened, unless it happened at this other site where the Greek Orthodox built a church because that's where it happened. So there's two Annunciation sites. Uh, and then Nazareth is in the West Bank. It's a, a Palestinian town inhabited by Palestinians and fringed with uh, Jewish settlements. So let's all get on this bus and go into this um, town. Number 1071. From tour bus number 1071, Oh, and also the souk, which is the marketplace. Uh, one other Arab word, kateyaf. Kateyaf, uh, kateyaf griddles. Kateyafs are the pancakes that you use to break the Ramadan fast. So it, you make them all day, and then at sundown you could have one. Uh, kateyaf. Okay, so here we go. From tour bus number 1071, the souk of Nazareth tumbles into perception crookedly. Laundry and Arabic flapping from signs. The tint of my window, not the only veil this Shabbat in Ramadan to throng an agony of shops piled like bodies in blistering noon. No one seems to object to trade or to the giant kateyaf griddles clogging the walkway. It costs not but sundown to breakfast on sweet pancakes that crisp into precise dots on the grills. Fasting merchants fry them, counting like beads the tedious hours. Our guides Jewish and shouts into his hot mic. The objects unfit to absorb his hapless announcements, just as he's at a loss to absorb the Annunciation's radical obedience. We hear his perception. The angel tells the virgin she's pregnant. Well, he must wonder what in sweet bejesus makes such garbled implausibility worth amplification, itself a challenge through the coach's errant sound system. He segues into a rabbi and priest joke as the Catholic herd wads of USDA prime fat gain on the minor basilica up al Bashara. Leave your valuables, he's replying to hissing brakes and cattle queries. They'll pick your pockets. We roll to a halt, the point at which our grotto's air-conditioned car exhumes its pilgrims. Fear not, the angel said to Mary. Today in Palestine, the price of security is freedom of speech. We say nothing to the joke or the Islamophobia our guide purveys. We obey. Outside, we walk. Our object is a church, not disclosure. 
and certainly not cops, rivals to absolute wah, rivals to absolute authority. My tribe veils its descents. Christotokos, Theotokos. Just north is an Orthodox church built at Mary's well. The sites the Greeks claim for not, according to Rome, Gabriel visited. When we arrive at the Roman perception of the Annunciation, it disappoints. A bulky circa 1969 horror from its sets of pseudo-primitive stained glass windows to the awkward concrete dome it sports. Tonight, the corner of Al Bishara and Paula Sashishi will be a street fair for pancake eating Muslims. But now, it marks the site of a gift shop, and our guide steers us there before we can schismatize. He pauses at the door, then points to a billboard There is no God but Allah. The sign upbraids us in English. See, he says, you are a minority too. The store sells many a genuine olive wood carving priced in US dollars, but I hail the perfectness of a Ramadan pancake, full of grace, manna-esque, next door at a bakery that is making them, and so I split off to offer a shekel. My silvered palm situates me between money changers and Judas, I think. The Arab clerk starts so violently at my mission, I laugh, he laughs. We trade, we have not come far. Thank you. my favorite poem that I've written. You know, it changes. It's kind of fun to do a reading where I was going to read from, largely because I don't have very many of each book, so I'm reading from all of them. Um, you know, I went back to um, some of these poems I haven't read for a really long time, and I don't, part of me is saying, hey, not half bad. And the other part is saying, oh, I would never write that. And like, who cares? Who cares? So maybe the newest is the most beloved. I don't know. Yeah, Joni. Yeah, we do. I, one thing that can be puzzling is, is how, to, how to bring poetry to the Middle East. Like, how do you bring poetry to the Middle East? How do you bring poetry to the that you think of poetry as a, a, a like a personal meditation, but then you're bringing it out and it's considering the meditations among or the, the, the personal situation of different people. It, 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 it um, uh, and that that kind of complex world of things that are hard to write poetry about. Would you? Okay, so I, mean? Would you I think the, the questions about like sort of, we were talking last night about frame of reference, like, like widening out your frame of res reference so it can bring in a thing like the current political climate or, you know, Britney Spears, who would not be the person you would pick, or Whitney Houston's dead, for crying out loud, you know, you wouldn't, you, and so, but at the moment she was, you know, it at the moment of writing that, so you're ta maybe talking about where the boundary between a, an eternal art form, uh, you know, I am writing for the unborn that will be, you know, arising centuries hence. And like, I don't know, what about us? Like, don't we want to read and write poems now in this moment? Um, and 
I mean, I've definitely, obviously, made my piece with contemporary reference. Um, so what, you know? So Dante did it all the time. Reading Dante is like reading, you know, the newspaper from the 13th century. And you're like, I don't know any of these people. Why are you assuming that I know these people? Well, you know, he, he was, he, he didn't have a boundary there, so I don't either. But I'm a poet of expansion. Uh, and there are so many wonderful poets who write in a much more uh, laconic and, and uh, well, people like Emily Dickinson, you wouldn't catch her making a contemporary reference. Um, so, you know, there, 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 there are poems out there for every taste. My taste tends to be in the put it in. Here's a big old kitchen sink. Let's put it all in. I'm a, you know, person who enjoys a casserole. <laughs> And I'm very much interested right now because, I mean, I noticed immediately after the election of uh, the current president that the kinds of poems my students were bringing in changed, the kinds of things I started writing changed. I mean, I'm very influenced by the current political moment. So that, you know, the bombs are headed one way and it ain't up poem is not, you know, a, the kind of thing I can't not write now. I think um, I need, I'm, my project I was telling my students last night, it, right now, while I'm here in this, this mountain of intellect and peace and snow, but it was really nice today, uh, is, is to make peace somehow with the political poem and to just figure out where I stand on that and craft what I think a political poem is from my aesthetic. Yeah. What poets have influenced you, your writing, or just your thought process, or anything, your creative process? So the question is what poets have influenced me. Uh, the um, sort of my lodestar or lodestone. Is it a lodestone or a lodestar? It's both. Is Walt Whitman. Um, so that kind of exhilaration. And you know, I mean, there are theories that he never, that he had very little actual human contact, but his imaginative human contact is so expansive and, and I, I identify with that impulse. It's what I love to do in a poem is um, pour forth. So he's a big one for me. Um, and then, I, I mean, I'm writing under the shadow of Joni Makowski right now <laughs> in triple meter curse you. So whatever I've just read also has an influence on me. But he's somebody I can keep coming back to. Yeah. Yeah. How did you decide on poetry as a career? How did I decide on poetry as a career? So one of my mentors, Richard Howard, said, being a successful poet is like being a successful mushroom. <laughs> and I'm still not quite sure what he meant, but I thought, you know, he's probably right. <laughs> so, you know, I wrote, I started writing Villanelles because I read that Villanelle in the back of the bell jar and was like, I want one of my, I, I want one for me. I want, you know. So it's a hobby that I can't get rid of, right? And then the, um, the, the thing that happens late at, on whatever timetable it happens for any particular poet is the threshold to readership. That's a different thing. And maybe that's the moment at which you could legitimately say poetry is not like mushrooms. <laughs> Um, and uh, you, uh, I needed to feel that I had mastered the line in some way. I had some ground under me before I was ready to show any of the piles of poems I'd amassed to anybody. Um, but I did step over that threshold and it was quite late. I was out of undergraduate for 10 years before I ever took a writing workshop where I showed somebody something I'd written. Um, and I was ready for it then. And then things move quickly from that moment. 
Um, but, you know, separate the, I mean, you're never going to get rich writing poetry, you know, so, which is good. There's no money in it. That's good. So you, it's very easy to separate what you're doing because it's your art and you can't not write a poem and you can't the only way you know how to think about an ethical dilemma is from making it into a sonnet or like imagining seagulls and turning them into punctuation or something like that you know like if you're that person you're going to write poems you're just going to do it because you have to and it's this hobby you can't get rid of and you it's very easy to separate that from the benefit, like this is a huge benefit. I, I have a semester here, um, you know, because I publish some books, but those are published because I was ready for readers. And so I took a world, a step out into the world of readers and books are for readers, not for me. They're for the people reading them. Does that make sense? More or less? It's 529, is there time for one more question or should we receive, we have a reception. One more, yes. Uh, could you describe the uh, process that you use in the development of your, uh, your poetry? Uh, also, you, you cover a lot of diverse subjects, you know, broad, and political, and curling, and whatever. Could you just talk a little bit about the process and the development? Um, sh sure. The question was about uh, the process of developing a poem, or my my process as a poet. And um, the thing I do, uh, Fro Frost has this essay that I'm making my undergraduates read. I'm sure they've read it. It's at the be the last part of the image packet, kids, um, where he talks about um, facts sticking to him like burrs. Um, and that's not a bad way to think about uh, the collecting of material. I also identify with the magpie who will just pick up things because they're shiny, you know, <laughs> or just, you know, magpies have a taste and they just go, they'll just grab objects that they just like. Um, so I do that and I collect material. Um, and then I sit on it because I don't know what I'm going to do with it. So, you know, I have this Audubon bird guide and I just loved the entry on brown-headed cowbirds. I just loved it. And I loved the ivory-billed woodpecker entry. Uh, and, and it wasn't until later that I figured out how that material was going to be used. So the process is very indefinite. You know, it's an imaginative process. It's invisible to me. Uh, but sometimes when I sit down to write and there's material, there's a subject on my mind, a political subject or, you know, whatever it is, uh, a, a, a piece of, you know, a scrap of, like, look at these pants, right? Yeah. Like, look at these pants are flocking. They're flocked. They're, I had wallpaper like this in the hallway, which was the only fancy room in my house. Was like the entryway that, uh, for the front door that nobody used, right? So that room had all this fancy wallpaper that looked just like my pants, only it was red. And so flocking, like I'm gonna get me some of that and I'm gonna keep it in a drawer. And there's gonna be a moment when the texture of that and the, my personal association with it is going to connect to something that I think I haven't quite figured out yet and a poem can help me do it. And then it'll be like, oh, you got chocolate in my peanut butter and they'll all come together. My process is like a Reese's peanut butter cup ad. There you go. I think that's a great place to stop. All right, thank you. This is a production of Cornell University.